Uh, last week, we started a uh, new little segment. We started off to close out the series of Fanatics um, called uh, Great Moments in Nathan Sports History, where we relive some of my glory days together, and it's just a really fun experience. And um, last week, you got to hear about the time I mooned 2,000 of my friends and family uh, unintentionally. And um, so here is uh, week two, installment two of Great Moments in Nathan Sports History. I don't know uh, if you're a competitive person or not. Um, sometimes it gets the best of me. For sure, when I was younger, I had an issue with it. Uh, you know, like I was a pretty decent kid. I didn't get in trouble a lot or anything. I tried to represent Jesus well to my school and all that. But sometimes, you know, the game just got the best of me. I remember one time in high school, we were playing um, our dreaded rivals, the Nuevo Lions. And uh, there was this kid on, on the Nuevo's team. He's just, he's a dirty player, right? Like, you know, people who play ball like that. Benny was that guy. And this one game in particular, he was having an issue with his hands. Uh, he, every time he would go to set a pick on somebody, he would assume the pick setting position. And then as uh, our player would make contact with him or whatever, his hand would fly violently up into our nether regions. I don't know if it was like Tourette's or what issue he was having, but he had some sort of issue with his hands. Uh, and uh, it had happened to me a couple times in the game. And so I'm, uh, one time I'm chasing the guy that I'm guarding and out of nowhere, here comes Benny. And he's like this, right? And it, it is really fast. I'm about to collide with him. So I put my hands up as I'm about to crash into him. And then out of the corner of my eye, I see his hands moving. And I'm like, oh no, what do I do? So I have this split second decision. I can either drop my hands and try to block it or, or just leave him high and crash into him. And it didn't start off like intentional, but I definitely knew what I was doing when I just raised this elbow a little bit and swung it through his head and just dropped him like a sack of potatoes. It felt pretty good, to be honest. Um, it, but that competition sometimes gets the best of us. In college, I was even worse. You know, ask my wife how much fun it was to be around for the next two, three, four days after we lost a super important intramural sports game, right? Like, don't talk to me. I don't, I'm not fun to be around for a few days after we lose one. Anybody else like that? Yeah. So uh, probably, though, the moment that I'm most embarrassed of my competitive pride getting the best of me was when uh, I was working as a youth minister at a church over on the south side of Detroit. I'm 22, 23, and uh, playing church league softball. Um, I don't know if you've ever played church league sports, but I'm pretty sure Jesus wants nothing to do with how most Christians behave in church league. Um, but I'm playing shortstop for our church league softball team, and a ball gets hit out to the fence. And so my job is to go out and be the cutoff. And so I run out to be the cutoff. I'm out in the outfield, and, um, and the ball is coming into me. Now, in high school— for my Grant Tigers. Uh, I was quarterback, I was a pitcher, so I have a decent arm. I'm not like the world's best or anything, but I could throw some heat. And so as the ball's coming into me, I'm thinking, there's a guy going to home, I can't get him out. And I'm pretty sure of that, pretty sure. But, but maybe, just maybe, if I throw my absolute hardest, and to be honest with you, like I really didn't care about getting him out. I wanted to throw as hard as I could so that people would be impressed with my arm. So that people on the other team would go, man, guy at short's got a cannon. Don't run on him. You're like, oh, wow, can he throw? And so in my head, I'm like, I'm going to just throw this ball as hard as I can. And everybody will just be wowed at how, how good an arm I have. And so the ball comes in, and I turn, and I hurl it as hard as I can. And it's an absolute rope to home plate. But my competitive pride um, blinded me to remembering that this is co-ed softball. And our catcher is this brave little 14-year-old girl <laughs> who is standing at home plate with her glove out like this and her arm over her eyes, praying Nathan doesn't hit her in the face. And I don't want to brag, but I threw a strike. Right? That thing popped her in the glove just perfectly. Dude was safe. And, and then the crying started, you know? And then they took the glove off and the swelling started. And then mom drove her to the hospital where they confirmed that her youth minister had broken her hand trying to... Th show off his arm in co-ed church league softball. Yeah, I'm the worst. Hey, how you doing? Good to meet you. Sometimes it gets the best of us. So welcome to week three of Fanatics, where we're talking about just how carried away we can get with competition, with sports, with fandom, whatever we're fans of. Uh, and the question we're asking is, are we willing to be similarly crazy for our faith? And when I think about people who are crazy about their faith, I think of one guy in particular— I don't know if you know anybody who just um, is kind of next level when it comes to being crazy about their faith. I don't mean like just a little weird, like because we're all a little weird. I'm a little weird at least, right? But somebody who's just kind of way out there in left field, right? Off their rocker a little bit about their faith. Like if there are any social norms about this, they don't know what they are, right? In scripture, 
That's a guy named John, right? This is the introduction we're given to John in Scripture. He kind of goes, hey, I want you guys to meet my friend John. Um, He preached out in the woods. Middle of nowhere, that's his congregation, telling whoever happens to be out there to repent, right? Like, can you imagine if you go over to Hoffmaster, you just go on a little hike through the woods, and some guy steps out from behind a tree, and he's like, repent, and then he steps back behind the tree. That's John. He's like, hey, weird, right? He says, uh, Scripture says, hey, you think that's weird? Let's talk about his wardrobe for a minute. Um, he, he wore like a camel hair rug as clothes, and that's kind of all we're given that he wore, and a leather belt around his waist to tie it all together, just on point, kind of like Sam's outfit, just a little off base, you know what I mean? Um, and uh, he also ate bugs and honey. That was his diet. Bugs and wild honey. Do you know how hard wild honey is to get? Like, there's a reason you buy that at the store. And this is the description we're given of John. Just a real weirdo, right? Except that everything John does is intentional. And even the description we're given in Scripture of who John is is not accidental. John is telling us, with everything about him, who he's supposed to be. And Scripture wants to make sure that we don't miss who John is by the way it tells us about him. See, John is born at a time in history when God has been silent for 400 years. Generations of people have come and gone, lived and died without ever hearing the voice of their maker. But John knows exactly what he's here to do. Break the silence. And in no small way either, God is about to shout to create all of creation through Jesus. And John is here to make sure that people are listening. Now, uh, the greatest prophet in Israel's history is a guy named Elijah, the most prolific voice for God. And and here is the description in Scripture that we're given of this man, Elijah. In 2 Kings 1.8, some people are gathered together telling the king who they ran into. They replied, it says, uh, that this guy, he had a garment of hair and had a leather belt around his waist. The king said, that was Elijah, the Tishbite. By description alone, this king knows who Elijah is. Uh, Now, there's some debate. It's an interesting uh, translation debate about that word there, uh, whether uh, Elijah was uh, wearing camel hair or he was hairy like a camel, but that's for a different sermon. Uh, But the writer wants to make it clear when he tells you about John that this should bring someone to mind for you. Why is sort of the question. Like, why does John dress this way? Well, for a couple of reasons at least. One is that he wants to evoke for the people of Israel uh, the memory of Elijah. He says, do you guys remember when God used to speak? Do you remember when God used to speak to the prophets? He's about to do that again. Listen up, people. And the second reason is this. Um, Do you know how you make John's outfit? a camel hair uh, tunic, if you will. You know how you make that? You find a dead camel, you skin it, you punch a hole in it, and just like that, you have your clothes picked out for the next several years. I don't know how long it takes for a camel hair tunic to wear out, but quite a while, I'm sure. Fast, easy. Is it rough and smelly? Definitely. But uh, easy done outfit for John. Scholars will tell you that he dressed specifically in camel hair as opposed to other animals because uh, like with a smaller animal, he would have had to sewn several hides together. But with a camel hair tunic, uh, one camel it will do the job and he's done. One hole, one camel hide, and that's it. Um, he took a Nazarite vow to make sure that he didn't have to waste any time cutting his hair or his beard. He ate bugs and wild honey. Why does he eat that? How hard is it to find bugs in the wilderness, right? Does John have to worry about putting together a grocery list and getting to the market? Does he ever have to worry about, what am I going to eat today? He just, whatever is at hand is what Elijah's, or John, uh, his diet is. Uh, scripture is telling us that uh, John has more important things on his mind than worrying about getting to the store. The rough clothing, the austere diet, bring to mind for people these self-denying prophets of old. Not some lucrative uh, rabbi, some televangelist. You know, that's why you'll never see uh, Todd or I appear in a three-piece suit. Um, John's clothes and diet were this living parable for everyone who met him, protesting the softness um, of the religious establishment in Israel. And this is 
how fanatical John is, how focused John is, that he doesn't want to waste a single minute of his life worrying about what to wear. Do I have to go to the mall and pick out new clothes? Do these still fit after Thanksgiving? Do I have to cut my hair? Do I have to? Not a single moment of his life is wasted on any of those things. Uh, the great Jim Harbaugh, I'm told, has a closet full of khakis, right? And when asked why khakis all day, every day, he said it's because of this, that he doesn't want to wake up and waste a single amount of mental capacity or intensity picking out what to wear for the day. He wakes up, knows exactly what he's going to wear, and he can go about getting on today's mission. Can you imagine being so crazy, right? So obsessed with your job or your mission that even the things you wore fell subject to accomplishing it. Well, that's John. And church, um, you and I, we are modern-day John the Baptist, calling to people in the wilderness to repent. The kingdom of God has come leading people to the Messiah. And you and I, we live in a modern-day wilderness. Do you know that uh, North America, I don't know if they included Antarctica in this study or not, but but North America is the only continent on the planet in which Christianity is on the decline. All those scary places where they murder Christians in the street for their faith, Africa, India, Asia, it's exploding over there, but here where we live on our rock, it's struggling. You and I live in a modern-day wilderness. And here's what I can tell you about fanatics. Fanatics aren't soft. Fanatics don't choose easy roads. They aren't soft. I saw this list this week on Facebook. Somebody shared it. I thought it was um, interesting considering the series that we're doing, so I thought I'd share it with you. Um, Ten reasons why Christians don't attend sporting events. One, coach never came to visit me. I'm not going to the game. Two, every time I went, they asked me for money for tickets and stuff, right? Three, the people sitting in my row didn't seem very friendly. Four, the seats were very hard. Five, the referee made a decision I didn't agree with. Six, some games went into overtime and I was late getting home, never going back. Seven, the band played some songs I'd never heard before. Eight, the games are scheduled on my only day to sleep in and run errands. Nine, since I read a book on sports, I feel like I know more than the coaches anyway. Uh, Ten, my parents took me to too many games when I was growing up. Listen, fanatics, followers of Jesus aren't soft, and they don't make excuses for anything. There's nothing that will keep them from their Jesus. And Jesus said this about John. He says, what then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yeah, I tell you, and even more than a prophet. Jesus would say about John that he was the greatest man ever born of a woman. Was it because John was soft, because he was normal, because he dressed like everyone else, because he fit? Or was it because John was so fanatical about his mission that everything in his life fell subject to accomplishing it? You know what's interesting is uh, what I've noticed about fanatics is that when things get hard, when, when it gets rough, when, when there are challenges that arise, when most would cover up or shrink back or hide, fanatics do one thing in particular. They worship. I went to the, uh, the Michigan-Michigan State game earlier this year. I can't remember how it ended. Uh, it escapes me. So let's say it ended in a tie. And, um, <clears throat> but one thing I do remember is that in the middle of the third quarter, this monsoon swept over the stadium. You could see it start on the far end of the stadium, and then section by section, it just came for us, right? And at first, everybody's like tensing up. They're trying to find ways to hide or put something on. Or, but it just rains heavier and harder. And eventually, people go, you know what? This ain't going to stop. Um, and so they did this. What they did was they just embraced it, Right? The student section, instead of putting on more layers, they started taking layers off. Everybody is dancing and singing. It is uh, just going crazy. The place is nuts. It's maybe the most fun I've ever had at a sporting event, you know, until it ended in that tie. Um, But it was, it was this like worship thing happening. Fanatics are willing to be thought of as fools. I remember hearing about uh, a pastor in Southern California who had this growing congregation. 
and uh, they were looking at building this new sanctuary for the church for, to fit all the new people in and all that sort of stuff. And it's going to cost tens of millions of dollars. And, and the pastor went to the church, went to the board, and said, listen, couldn't we for like one one-hundredth of the cost put up an outdoor amphitheater and we could just all sit out there and do church? And the board pushed back and said, you know, people aren't going to come and sit on the grass. And, and what if it's windy or it rains or, you know, it gets cold? Uh, people won't show up. The pastor's response was this, have you ever heard of the Green Bay Packers? Every week for four, five, six hours, 80,000 people sit outside in Wisconsin in the fall and in the winter to celebrate their team. And we live in Southern California. Cold is like 65 for us, right? But, you know, like, if, if you asked fans to toughen up, if they had to sit in adverse weather conditions to celebrate and do it, right? Like, that's why at a sporting event, if, like I saw this at Michigan State, just snowing like crazy, watch everybody leave, head for the exits. They just all leave. See how they're all going away? Oh, no, it looks like they all stayed. So you're telling me that um, instead of calling it quits, they sing? They sing, let it snow, bring it on, nothing will keep us from celebrating our team? Funny how foolish, how crazy hard we'll go, what lengths we'll go to for our teams. And... At the same time, every pastor in America knows that if it rains, even though our services are inside, attendance is going to take a drop. One of, uh, one of the great kings in Scripture is this guy named David. And um, kings are supposed to act like kings, regal and royal. Uh, but that's not David. David is willing to look like a fool in front of his kingdom, and, and I love that about him. Uh, 2 Samuel 6 tells us about one exchange. It says this, um, Verse 5, David and all of Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord with castanets, harps, lyres, timbrels, sistrums, and cymbals. Um, and then in verse 14, wearing a linen ephod, uh, his knickers, so to speak, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. And as the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, uh, David's wife, watched from a window, and when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. Um, this summer, my wife Sarah and I, we went to a John Mayer concert. Um, it's one of our favorites, and as sort of a going away present from our uh, church in, in Lexington, a friend had given us tickets. And so we drove down to Cincinnati, and with 20,000 other people, uh, enjoyed this concert. Uh, he's so good live, and, and we had a blast, and, but then so did everyone. Um, but something that struck me was that the people around us, they didn't just enjoy the concert. There was this group of girls that were in front of us, like right in front of us, and, and they just watched sometimes because, because the, every song that was played, they knew every single word. And they would sing at the top of their lungs along with the band, and they would have their hands raised and their, their head bowed and their eyes closed. Sometimes they would be so, like, passionate about the words that they were singing, they would just beat their chests as they swayed back and forth. And I thought, um, these girls aren't here to appreciate an artist. They're having a worship experience, like full out, no other way to describe it, these girls are worshiping with all of their hearts, and John Mayer is their God. People are made to worship. We just are. It's ingrained in every one of us. The only question is who or what will we worship? The created or the creator? Um, they were worshiping this man with God-given talent instead of the God who gives talent. Paul catches this thought in Romans 1 where he tells us that they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and they turned and they, they worshipped the created instead of the creator. And people have been doing this forever. It, it's a God-given reaction that when we are overwhelmed by what we see or what we hear or overwhelmed by our inability to control it, whether it's the rain or the snow, 
or pain, we fall and we worship. That's what we do. And David holds nothing back when he worships the God who has been so good to him because he's so fanatically in awe of of his God that he can do nothing else. One of the things it says that David, he celebrated, he danced, and he uses this phrase twice in those verses we read, that he did it with all of his might. With all his might. I love that. He knows he probably looks like a fool. I mean, he's, he's dancing. I have never danced publicly or privately without feeling like a total fool. And here is David dancing with all of his might. And I wonder, you know, when's, when's the last time you worshiped God with all of your might? Just so completely lost in awe of your God that that you can't control it. Whether it's because you are overwhelmed by how good he's been to you or overwhelmed by the things that life has brought your way, have you been willing to, to look like a fool when chasing after your God? You know why we keep, uh, why we keep the lights slow in here during worship? It's a little insider information for you, okay? So some people think it's because it's of the band or the lights or whatever, but the real reason is this is that most people, and myself included, um, we get self-conscious when we know people can see us worshiping. Uh, we tend to uh, close up, hold back a little bit uh, because we don't want to stand out or have people see us or notice us in that environment. And, and that is the absolute last thing we want uh, from our church, from our people, is, is that people are holding back in their worship of God. And you know, also, like me anyways, I'm a little ADD, and so when the lights are up and I can see somebody on the other side of the room moving or fidgeting or somebody walks in or out, my head immediately does this, right? And I lose, I lose focus on worshiping my king. And so we keep the lights low because we don't want any distractions for you. Nothing to come between you and, and worshiping him with all of your might. Fanatics are willing to be thought of as fools because their God is worth it. It doesn't matter to whom or where fanatics are preaching the gospel with every part of their life. The way they treat their families preaches the gospel of Jesus. The way they treat people in need preaches the gospel of Jesus. The way they do the job, the way they treat their neighbors, the things they choose to spend their money on, the things they choose to spend their time on preaches the good news of Jesus. These are acts of worship for us. I wonder, though, who is the hardest person for you to preach the gospel to? Are there people for you that you, just, like, you find it very hard to love them as Christ loves us? Um, it's the holidays. Maybe you just did or soon will spend a, a whole day with a room full of relatives. Anybody in that group that you find difficult to preach the gospel to? There's a story in Scripture of a man named Jonah, and God is calling him to preach to a group of people called the Ninevites. And so from last week, he's listening for the voice of God. Problem is, he doesn't like the voice of God when he hears it. Anybody else ever been there? <laughs> like God is telling you, go talk to this person, and you're like, I don't really don't want to. I hear you, just don't want to, right? Because they're weird, or, or I don't know them, or worse yet, you do know them. You been there? And so God is telling Jonah to go Problem is, the Ninevites are his rivals. They're his enemies. He hates the Ninevites. It would be like if God told me to go and preach to the Buckeyes. Sorry, no offense. Uh, God and I would have a little fight about that, right? Like, so Jonah does what I might do, what many of us might do. Is he turns and he runs the other way. Because we're good at drawing lines between people. People we want to do things for or don't want to do things for. But I don't believe that God sees us that way. I don't think that God looks down and sees Buckeyes and Wolverines and Spartans. He doesn't see Israelites and Ninevites. He sees people who need love, who need the good news of Jesus. And he's calling us to go to them whether we find it to be easy or that these would be the most difficult people in the world to preach to, to share the good news with. Because the gospel of Jesus is worth that. One of my favorite quotes, uh, it's actually one that my wife turned me on to, is by a guy named Jim Elliott. Jim was a missionary, and he and a few other families flew down to the Amazon uh, to reach this unreached people group in Ecuador. 
And uh, they would spend some time down there um, helping, loving, uh, preaching to this tribe, uh, only to have them one day just unprovoked turn and kill most of them. I love this quote by Jim, though. Um, He says this, He is no fool. He's no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. So what if being a fanatic costs us some comfort? So what if it means we look foolish to our neighbors, our relatives, our friends? So what if it even costs us our lives? None of those were things you could keep anyway. And you and I, we have something we cannot lose. I wouldn't trade that for all the temporary in the world. One of the most compelling reasons for me to believe this gospel, the, the belief in the resurrection of Jesus, is that those who knew him best, those who, who perpetrated this story, the validity of this story to the world around them, were so convinced of its truth that they were willing to die for it. I don't have any... Uh, I don't have any reoccurring dreams. I don't know if you do. Uh, I have one dream that I have a lot. I have like every couple of weeks, which is sort of embarrassing, but it's not, it's different pretty much every time. I had it, in fact, Friday night, I had this dream. And in the dream, I dunk. It's stupid, but it's the happiest dream I ever had. I, I find myself, I jump, I'm in a, like somehow more than a basketball game, and I jump, and for some reason, I just sort of like start f- soaring. Like I jump higher than I've ever jumped before, and it's effortless, and I find myself above the rim. I'm like, this is amazing. And I just dunk the ball and I wake up so happy, which is sad because that will never, ever, ever happen in real life. But what if, um, what if I decided that I want people to think I can dunk or, or at least that I did it once. And so tonight at Open Gym, I gather the guys together and I go, listen, here's the deal. I want you guys to back me up on this. Just tell everybody that I dunked, okay? I pay them five bucks or whatever, but I want you guys to promise, you'll always have my back on this, that, that you saw me, you were there, you were there when it happened, you saw Nathan dunk. How long do they hold on to that lie? Like suppose there's an organization that goes around like trying to crush people's dreams and, and always like verifies that people did actually dunk, right? And there's the big brother or whatever, right? And so they go around, they go to the guys and, and start asking questions and stuff. Like when do they break on that, right? Like supposed to go to Todd and they go, Todd, you're a pastor, you can't lie. Did you see it happen? Did it really happen? And if Todd doesn't break, we go, okay, you know what? We're gonna take you to the back room and they start beating Todd until he tells the truth. Does Todd break, right? They hook him up to an electric chair and say, listen, Todd, here's the deal. You have to tell us the truth. In fact, you know what? Just, just say, just say Nathan didn't dunk. It's all you have to do. It doesn't have to even have to be true. We just need you to say it didn't happen or we're going to kill you. And Todd goes, you know what? Kill me then. I'm not going to back down. That would be crazy, right? Every one of Jesus' followers was tortured and, and murdered and would never once, not once did they back off that story. Well, that's crazy unless, unless it's really true. Unless they were really convinced they had something they just could not lose, even if it cost them their lives. Here's the thing this morning, you can have that too. Like, like if you don't have a moment in your life where you go like, this is where I started following Jesus and gained this thing I cannot lose. That I died to myself and was reborn Christ, resurrected with him, then you can have that today too. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to spend the rest of the morning worshiping together, and my hope is that as a church, we do it recklessly. We do it with all our might. Don't hold a single thing back as we chase after our God who's been good to us. And if uh, if you want to talk about uh, how you gain something you cannot lose, I'll be in the back by the bleachers. If you just need somebody to pray with you or whatever's going on in your life right now, I'd be honored to do that. But let's do this. Let's pray and then we'll stand and, and just worship our King together. Uh, dear God, I thank you for um, the ability to have some fun. I thank you for uh, this fanatic series where we just got to enjoy uh, celebrating things in, in life that we love. And we, and we thank you that you're the giver of all good gifts. And, and so... Um, most of all, God, we, we celebrate you. Because nobody, no thing, no team, uh, nothing 
is worth our worship like you are. So God, we, uh, we know that you inhabit the praises of your people, that you are present with us this morning. And so we sing, uh, chase after you and your presence. God, I thank you for Jesus, and I thank you for the people who told that story, the good news, the resurrection of Jesus, and were willing to give their very lives for it because they knew that um, what Christ brings, what he gives to each of us, is something that can't be lost, and we we would be foolish to do anything otherwise and chase after you. And so God, we love you. It's in your name that we pray this morning.